Uh, praise the Lord. It's good to be in God's house. And it's good to be back home. We, we like going away. and uh, we, like, we like going away, but we like coming back, too. And uh, it was a really good camp meeting, uh, convention, whatever you want to call it. And they had a, uh, the speaker there. I understand that John and John, Wednesday evening, they, they put it on. It was, it was uh, broadcast on the Internet. And they were watching it for a little bit. They had a speaker there. His name was Ishmael Charles. And he was a, uh, he's from the British Virgin Islands, uh, a great speaker. And, and Wednesday night's message kind of resounded with me. I'm going to go with it. I'm going to go with it. Because when you go to a place like that, they have those meetings. It's not just a time. It's not just like a pep rally, you know. But it's a time to get together and to be encouraged. And it's a time for God to speak to the, to the ministers in the state because the, m- many of the people were there. Most of them were either pastors or assistant pastors and so forth. And, and what he was talking about was rebuilding the altar. Rebuilding the altar. Uh, now, if, if a lot of churches will have like an altar rail. Now, we don't have one here. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they did it one time. This is an old church. It goes back to like 1920. So maybe the Free Methodists used to have an altar. I don't know if they did or not. Maybe it was removed. But, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a wooden place, a wooden rail you kneel at, although that's good. We have seats you can kneel at too if you want to pray. But an altar, when we talk about an altar, we talk about a place of meeting, a place where you meet someone or something. An altar is a place where you bring a sacrifice. Throughout the Bible, whenever you read about altars, you read about people meeting God, you read about people bring, bringing sacrifices, and you read about people having a mark of remembrance, something to remember. If you look at the patriarchs like uh, Isaac and Israel, Jacob, Noah, the first time the word altar is mentioned in the Bible was Noah. He built an altar to the Lord after, after the flood. But there were sacrifices before that. There were times when people, Abel offered a sacrifice. Abel and Cain both brought an offering to God. You remember that story. See, the difference was they both brought an offering, but only Abel brought a sacrifice. Now, that's a whole message in itself, and we're not going to go there this morning. But an altar is something that we set up to, to worship God, to honor God, to remember something God has done. If you remember Jeho- uh, uh, when Moses was in the wilderness and they were fighting the battle and, and uh, the two men had to hold his arms up with the staff so, when, uh, so the Israelites would win the battle. He made an altar. He called it Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah my banner. The Lord is my banner. When uh, Jacob was returning from Laban's house. He got to the place where he saw the, the ladder. He had the vision. He called it Bethel, the house of God. He made an altar there. You see, altars are important because it's a place where we worship. It's a place where we remember. It's a place where we give a sacrifice. And if you're born again, if you're saved, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, there's, an, there's been an altar in your life. When I came to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I built an altar. I don't remember the date, but I can take you to the place. They probably wouldn't let me in (laughs) because somebody else lives there now. But I can take you to the room where I was when I first met Jesus Christ. How many people can put their hands up and say, I can remember where I was. I can remember where I built the altar of remembrance. That place where I met God and he met me and he saved me. Out of sin. He took my feet from the miry clay. I can, rem- I can take it to the room. I can point to the floor where I was. And, and on top of that, I can take you to the place where I was when I got filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. It, was, it wasn't in the same room, but it was in the same house. I can point to the place I was. And I built an altar there. There's a place where I met God. And He met me. And that's where a place where my relationship with Him began. And from that time to this, there have been times in my life where I have built altars. How many people know what I'm talking about? There have been, there have been points, in time, uh, points of time in my life where, where I have met God. You know, God isn't one of them people you just meet Him one time and that's it. I mean, he, He's with you all the time. But there are some times when you just got to connect with God. Sometimes 
we forget that altar that we built. And many times, and this is something that what that brother said, he said, if you build an altar to God, I guarantee you, Satan's going to build an altar somewhere, somewhere nearby. But Brother D-Roy was sharing this last week about the alternatives. Huh? Remember in the Garden of Eden, Brother D was speaking about this, where you know God was fellowshipping with Adam and Eve in the coolness of the day and in the garden, and they were just having a great relationship. And old Satan come along and said, wait a minute, did God really say? And he built an altar of worship. And Eve built an altar of worship. And Adam built an altar of worship not to God, but to Satan. There are many of us, probably every one of us, can look back in our lives and see those times when we built altars, but it wasn't to God. They weren't holy altars. They might have been altars of sacrifice, but they weren't sacrificed to a holy God. They might have been altars of remembrance, but they weren't remembering a holy God. I can look back in my life and I see times and, and remember times that I built altars. See, those altars, they become strongholds. Those satanic altars that we build, they become strongholds. And they become an opposition. And sometimes we can go on for so long, you get saved and you're saved for 5 years, 10 years, 20 years, and you forget that altar you built in front, and you just remember all those other alt altars that you built and constructed from that time. If you, if you start going back in time, and going back to that time when you first got saved, if you ever got saved, you'll, you'll see, you'll stumble upon all those altars that you erected that were not of God. Altars of self, altars of money, altars of power, altars of whatever it might be. Things that, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We've all set them up. That brother preached Wednesday night, and he challenged people to go back to the, and rebuild the altar. That's what he challenged the ministers to. He challenged the ministers to take that back to their church, and I'm going with it. Because we need to go back. To where we began. If you're born, listen, if you, if you can't think back to a time when you came to know Jesus Christ, then you need to get saved. If you've never been born again and saved, then you need, you need to build that altar today. But if you've been there, and if you've traveled down that road, and you can't even remember what that altar looked or felt like, it's time that we start going back to rebuild the altar. There's a story in Kings, we're not going to turn there, we're going to turn to the Word in a little bit, but there's a story in Kings where, where a, a, a wicked king named Jeroboam built an altar. If you know the story, after Solomon died, the tribes of Israel divided. Two of the tribes stayed in Jerusalem under the reign of Solomon's son, and that was uh, uh, Judah and Benjamin. They stayed in Jerusalem. The other ten tribes, they went north, under a guy named Jeroboam. And when Jeroboam led these ten tribes north, he said, you know what? We're commanded every year to go to Jerusalem and worship at the temple, because they had the tabernacle there at the temple. And he said, if I let them go back, they might want to stay there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build another altar. I'm going to build an altar myself. So that way they don't have to go to Jerusalem. They can just stay here and worship. And if you read the story, when he built that altar, God sent a prophet. And he said, this altar is going to be destroyed someday. You see, all these strongholds and altars that we have built, listen, they're coming down. If we don't take them down, God's going to take them down. But he expects us to take them down. In the tabernacle, if you're familiar with the tabernacle, there were, there were two altars in the tabernacle. There was, an, there was what they call a brazen altar. When you first went into the, to the, to the enclosure, there was a brazen altar. That's where everybody would bring their offerings and sacrifices. That's where they would bring their sin offering and their trespass offering and all the approach offerings to God. And they would take the offerings and put them on that brazen altar and they would be burned up. Then there was another altar inside the holy place. And it was made of gold. That first altar was made of brass. It was brazen. The second altar was made of gold. That was the altar of incense. And the Bible says that incense going up was like the prayers of the saints. A sweet smelling savor in the nostrils of God. The first altar was one of judgment. The second altar was one of worship. But they all took a sacrifice. They all were places of remembrance. They were places of communication with God. Now, we can look at ourselves today and say, okay, we don't have those, I don't have an altar of incense. We don't have a place here where we put incense on and burn it and smoke goes up. 
We don't have that. We don't have a, a brazen altar where we bring animals, thank God, that we put them on and burn them. I don't want, I want that. So, so that altar thing, that's Old Testament. I want to tell you something. It's, it's not Old Testament. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's an altar. And there's a tabernacle. And you know where the tabernacle is? It's not in Jerusalem. They're going to build one there someday. They're going to have to to see God's promises fulfilled. The tabernacle isn't in Rome. It's not in... But the tabernacle is where... How many people know where the tabernacle is? Right here. The meeting place. Where people meet God. It's not in some foreign land. It's not you have to get an airplane ticket and fly 10,000 miles. The tabernacle is right here. We're the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. We're the dwelling place of God on this earth today. It's us. And there's an altar inside of you. There's a place of sacrifice, a place of worship, a place of remembrance. It's that place where you first met God. You remember that? You remember when you first met God? I think all the things that have been set up since then in my life, all the things that have been set up, and say, my God, I'd like to go back. I want to rebuild the altar. I want to challenge all of us. We've been challenged to rebuild the altar. This isn't a church program. It's not a, you know, a series of messages. This is a challenge. The way things are going in this world and nation, you better get back to where you begun. You better start pulling down the strongholds. I want to read some scripture to you. And if somebody's saying, he ain't opened the Bible yet. Well, I'm going to. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. See, this, this kind of stuff, people have, churches and ministers, they've kind of gone away from this kind of thing because this kind of preaching or looking at these kind of scriptures uh, will make people feel guilty. Listen, I don't want to make anybody feel guilty, but I hope you will be convicted. There's a difference. Guilt brings death. Satan makes you feel guilty. How many people know what I'm talking about? Satan will make you feel guilty. You remember when you did this? I mean, listen, we, we need to understand that we're, if, if you're born again and you're covered with the blood of Jesus Christ, all your sins are forgiven. He doesn't hold them against you anymore and never will. So, if what you hear today makes you feel a little uneasy inside, it's not guilt. I pray it's Holy Spirit conviction. Because it does just as much to me as it does to you. So don't say I have preachers up here trying to make me feel bad. This is what he says in verse 9. Know ye not. He uses that term, know ye not, like all kinds of times in this passage. Don't you know? Sometimes I, I, I like to, you know, we ought to stand in front of churches and say, don't you know? There are churches with thousands of people in them. and say, don't you know? Know ye not that the unrighteous shall what? Not inherit the kingdom of... Don't you know that? I mean, we got everybody going to heaven. There are folks who got everybody, well, you're going to heaven. Just go, God will forgive you. He's a big grandpa up there. And when you get up here, he'll say, that's okay. <laughs> know ye not. This, is, yeah, he doesn't, he, this isn't a suggestion. This is, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That means those people that have not been to the cross. Those people that have not been born again. Those people that have not been washed in the blood of Jesus. Those people who have not been covered and redeemed by the blood of the, of the, of the Lamb of God. He says, be not deceived. Don't be fooled. This is, this is not, this won't make CNN. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's, that's kind of plain, isn't it? Now see, the problem is, here's, here's the problem. The problem is folks who read this, who are saved, or think they're saved, they'll take that, and they'll wear that like a badge. They'll say, well, I don't do those things. Listen, you did them things. Somewhere in your life you did one of them, at least one of them things, maybe more. And, and, and in all honesty, your natural sin nature, if you let it go, it'll do it again. Without the blood of Jesus. You'll do it again. 
See, Paul dealt with that over in Romans. You know, Romans chapter 1, he talks about all the sinners, you know. And in chapter 2, he gets there and he talks about the religious sinners. Ain't nothing worse than a religious sinner. I don't care. All right. Look at verse 11. And such were some of you, Paul says. But, but now, through the blood of Jesus, not because you become a good boy or a good girl, but by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, if you go back to the Old Testament and you read about that tabernacle of Moses, God gave him commands of how to make all the stuff, the plates and the candlestick and the, all the stuff. He, he gave him commands how to do that. And they got people that were really good in making stuff like that. So they made all the stuff according to God's plan. But before they could use it, they had to sanctify it. And you know how they sanctified it? They got a red heifer. They got a cow. They got, a, they got an offering. And they took the blood. And it says that Moses sprinkled everything with blood before they could use it. It's not what it is on the outside, but it's what's covering the blood. It had to be sanctified. It had to be consecrated. Everything had to be set apart for God's purpose and marked for one thing and one thing only. That's God's purpose. Now what about us? Have you been sanctified, consecrated, set apart? I didn't ask you if you live a perfect, sinless life. Because if I ask that question, ain't one person going to put their hand up in here. Probably. Maybe. No, if you can, go ahead. Listen to what he says. The Apostle Paul says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful to me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I'm living under grace. I can do whatever I feel like doing. If you're being controlled by something other than the Holy Spirit, then your grace is like nullified. Grace, grace gives us the power to live under the control of the Holy Spirit. Listen. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. This is verse 13. But God shall destroy both it and them. See, this stuff that we're so wrapped up in, stuff that we're so concerned about, it's all going to be burned up. It's all going to turn to dust. It's called the law of entropy. Everything rusts. Everything rots. Everything decays. Nothing lasts forever in the natural. He says, now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God has both raised up the Lord and will raise up uh, by his, us by his own power. Verse 15. Know ye not, don't you know, that your bodies are the members of, of Christ. We're the body of Christ. Just like my finger is a member of my body, so we're all members of the body of Christ. My finger will hopefully do what I tell it to. My hand. You know, my brain sends, and it does. But what happens in the body of Christ when God sends a command to his people and they don't listen? Or they go off and they do their own thing. Or they go off and they, and, they, and they start building strongholds and building altars to other gods and to self and to money and to power and to all these, and to sex and all these other things that people build altars to. What happens is the body ceases to function like it should. We're all members. Know ye not that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that uh, which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, says he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Verse 18. Flee fornication. And we can take that word and we can apply it to individuals, you know, that are you know, doing things they shouldn't be doing. But it, it, it applies to everything. It applies to what we watch. It applies to what we listen to. It applies to, you know, what we think about, what we read. Sexual sin, sexual immorality. It's a billion, multi-billion dollar business. They sell... I'm going to say albums. You can tell how old I am. CDs. They sell all this stuff and make all this money. All these, like, all these, they're really, they're video prostitutes out there making a ton of money selling sex. And we buy it for our kids for a Christmas bread. He says, 
Flee fornication. Every sin that a man does is without his body, but he that commits fornication sins against his body. Verse 19. What? No, ye, don't you know, and this I said all that to get here, don't you know that your body is the temple of who? This is to Christians. If you're not a Christian, this doesn't apply to you. You're, you're, you're dying and on your way to hell. <laughs> if, you're not, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. If you haven't been to the cross, if you're not trusting in the blood, it really, it's, it's a moot point. But for those of us that can go back to the place where we build an altar to God, and we've allowed ourselves to get wrapped up in all these other altars and all these other things, and we've allowed our eyes to be clouded and our minds to be clouded, don't you know that if you've been to the cross, your body is a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit? I can remember when I built my altar, when I got saved. At that point, the Holy Spirit came into me. And I became a dwelling place of God. And everything I do on the outside is a reflection of who's on the inside. They say there's a lot of people but they won't come to Christ, not because they don't like Christ, because they don't like Christians. <laughs> know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? See, that's, that's the problem. We, we want to be our own. Well, you know, we're in charge. If you're a believer, you're not in charge. You're not supposed to be. If you're a believer and you're in charge, you've, you've built some altars somewhere that aren't to God. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay? We're the, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. God dwells inside of us. We should be willing and, and we should be anxious to be able to show the world who God is by how we live. It's, a, it's, a, it's accountability. It's a responsibility that we have. We have a debt. We're debtors to the price that Jesus paid for us. Turn over to 2 Corinthians. Just a few more. In chapter 6. And we want to start with verse... Uh, look at verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Read that. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? That means Satan. Or what part has he that believes with an infidel? Now, now listen to what he's saying. What business do we have as believers? And he's not talking about, you know, every day we rub, we rub elbows and shoulders with people in the world. Every day we go to work, we have friends, maybe family members. We're just not saying we should like lock ourselves in an ivory tower somewhere. It's not saying that we should, we should hide ourselves in, in a room somewhere and, and never talk to anybody. But it's, what it's saying is, who do we yoke ourselves with? What, what, are we, what are we connected to? Where's our altar? Where's our worship? Where's, who are, what are we worshiping? What are we sacrificing to? What are we remembering? He says, listen. Verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. That's you. If you're born again, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are the dwelling place of God. You're the tabernacle. You're the tent in which He lives. You're the only place where a dying world will be able to commune with Jesus Christ because of God in us. It says, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. In ancient Israel, Solomon built the temple, the mighty temple. And in that temple, he had the Ark of the Covenant. And that was, there was a veil over that that the, only the high priest could go in there once a year. And outside of that, there was the altar of incense that we talked about. And then outside in the, in the outer court, there was the brazen altar. And that's what God had set up. That was his plan. 
You go to the brazen altar, which is judgment, and then you go to the altar of incense, which is praise and worship. You get your sins judged on the cross, and you enter into the presence of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. But you know what those Israelites, you know what they did? They began to pollute the sanctuary. Now, how'd they do it? They kept the altar of incense. They kept the brazen altar. But then they said, well, uh, you know, this, this, uh, the god Chemosh of the Canaanites, we kind of think he's cool. So they would get a statue of Chemosh and they'd put it in there with the other ones. And they figured it's okay because we got the golden altar and we got the brazen altar. Well, we'll just add this one. And hey, it'll be like, you know, for everybody. We'll attract the, the Chemosh worshipers. We'll, they'll come in and worship, you know. Then they said, well, there's Baal. Baal, he's the fertility god of the, uh, of the Babylonians and the Canaanites. Well, 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 we'll put up a statue of him in there too. And hey, uh, it's, you know, they'll come in too. And we'll have just a big old church. We'll have everybody coming in because we have all these religions. And we'll bow down to this one. And we'll bow down to that one. And hey, I mean, God's all right. He's a big god. Don't want to put God in a box. You know, God put himself in a box. It was called the Ark of the Covenant. That's where he was. That was his mercy seat. But they, they, they put this God in, and they put that God in, and they still had. And you know what happened? After years, and you read about it all through the Old Testament, after years, they, they, they stopped using the, the original altars, figured, well, we don't need them, because they have Chemosh, and they had Baal, and they had Tammuz, and they had all the other gods. What's happened to your altar, to your tabernacle? You remember when you you remember when you made that altar? Sacrifice? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Remember when you first got saved and you said, Oh God. Wow. I got saved. You remember you first got saved and you experienced his presence? Not just not just by word, but you experienced, you sensed his presence. And as time went on, he said, well, I got the Lord dwelling inside of me. Maybe I can, maybe I can kind of squeeze this in. I'll build, an, I'll build a little altar over here. God won't mind. Let's build a little altar. I remember when I first got saved. I'll just say this story for myself. When I first got saved, there's some things that you couldn't pay me to do. I'm not going there. I'm not listening to that. I'm not watching that. Oh, I'm saved. And as time went on, it's like, well, you know, gee, I'm bored. Maybe, yeah, maybe just a little. Maybe just this one isn't too bad. And we built an altar and another altar. And you know what's happened over the years? Those altars become strongholds. See, and all through, you know, the, the, the beginning was here, and from there to here, instead of, instead of that, that clear view of that altar that we built when we first got saved, we got all this other junk all over the place. How many know what I'm talking about? If you're saved, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you just got saved and you, you ain't there. Praise the Lord. But when that brother got up on Wednesday night, and started preaching. He said, Church of God in Pennsylvania, you need to rebuild the altar. You need to go back to where you began. That's simple. That's a simple message. That's an old message. We've heard that a hundred times. But we need to hear it a thousand times. Because it seems that our memory is short. I can't go back to the house I lived in when I got saved because they'll throw me out. Somebody else lives there. I can't just walk in and say, excuse me, I'm going <laughs> to... They'll have me arrested. But I can go back to where that altar was built in me. One more, one more passage of Scripture, and then we're going to close. And, and, and you know what, what I'm going to do? Uh, well, let's read. Hebrews. Turn to Hebrews. Chapter 3. And I... I thank the Lord. I asked him to just keep that up so we have to turn pages today, but that's okay. Hebrews chapter 13. And 
look at verse 8. It says this. Jesus Christ, the same. He hasn't changed. God has not changed one bit. The same God that spoke creation into existence way back in Genesis 1-1 is the same God that's there today. It's the same God that sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. He hasn't changed. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Holy, holy is the Lamb who was slain. He never changes. He says, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Oh, Lord. help For it is a good thing that the heart be established with what? Grace. Established. Settled. Uh, settled in the faith. Settled in grace. Knowing what you believe. It's amazing. They were talking, uh, Brother Vest was talking uh, during the afternoon meetings, about how many people don't have, a, they go to church every, every Sunday and don't have a clue what the Bible says. If you go to church, you ought to at least, if, if, if you don't hear nothing from the Bible the rest of the week, you at least ought to hear it in church. He says, for it's a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar. Whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. I want to tell you something. Religion can't get you there. See, I can go back and think, well, I can't remember when I was baptized because I was just a little baby. <laughs> But that baptism doesn't get me there. It doesn't make me the person I need to be. I can remember going to the Sunday school and going to catechism and all that. Yeah, in the first holy communion. I can remember all that stuff. It was all religion. But religion doesn't give you that altar. In fact, people that practice religion have no right to call Jesus their Lord and Savior. He, here he was writing this letter to people who were think, Jewish Christians who were thinking about going back to the, to, the, to the law of Judaism. And he was saying, listen, that's got nothing to offer you. Religion has nothing to offer you. Listen to what he says. Be not carried about with diverse winds and, uh, uh, and, and strange doctrines. Verse 9. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them which have been occupied therein. Verse 10. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin and burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the camp. Our altar is at the cross. That's where our lives begin. When we look to the suffering Savior hanging on the cross of Calvary. And when we see that sacrifice. He was the sacrifice. He was the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. And we worship Him there. Then we have a place of remembrance where our lives begin. Our eternal lives begin. They begin at the cross. They don't begin at church. It's good to go to church. They don't begin singing worship. I love to worship God and sing. It's wonderful. But our lives begin at the altar of the cross with Jesus as the sacrifice. And as we worship Him, that's our place of remembrance. I want to ask you this morning, how many people have that place of remembrance? How many people can remember when they came to the cross? You might not remember the day. Maybe you don't even remember the place. But I remember. How many people remember when they said, Jesus, save me. Forgive my sins. Make me a new creature. Can we go back there? Can we begin to look and take a journey back in time? in your spirit, in your heart. And as we go back, we'll see, well, I remember this altar I set up. I remember when I did this. Oh. I remember when I started worshiping at this altar. When I started worshiping, it was just, it was just a little something, but now it's become a 
stronghold. I can remember when I, when I first looked at this, in, in, uh, in, in the first time I looked at it, I said, oh, God, I'd never look at that. But then after time goes on, I started, that, that altar started looking really appealing to me. And I, I started to look. I, how many people can go back in time and look at those times when you, when you forsook your first love? I'm talking to Christians. I'm not talking to people who are lost. I'm talking to believers. How many people can look back and walk back and say, I remember, I remember when I denied Jesus here. I remember when I, I was able to just, to just you know, shrug my shoulders and pretend like this was okay. And, and, and I remember when, when I, the Holy Spirit convicted me about this, but I said, oh, no, God, it's all right because, I mean, after all, I can remember. How many people can remember all those times you turned your back on God? And you allowed the altar that you had built when you first got saved to become defiled and polluted by the things of the world. I want to challenge you to go back and rebuild your altar this morning. This isn't just a program. It's not a game. Listen, this is something. This is serious. Because the way things are going in this world now, you better go back. You better get, you better get anchored. You better get rooted. You better get established in God's Word. You better know that you're saved. Because everything in this world is going to try to convince you that you're not. You know what I found out? There have been things that have happened that have made me question everything, every time I thought I ever heard of God. Or I thought I, I heard something from God. You know, you hear from God, you say, oh God, oh that's, that's the Lord. And you find, and it blows up at, on you, huh? And you want, did, God, did I hear from you? Anybody ever say that? God, did I hear from you? And then you start thinking about every other time you thought you heard from God. God, did I hear from you? Did you really tell me to? You better be established. You better take authority. You better be anchored in God's word and go back to that altar. Because if you go back to, if you, if you get back to that relationship with him that you had, you won't have any doubts about anything. He'll let you know. He'll let you know. I want to ask you this morning, how many people want to go back? Take me back to the place where I first believed. But listen, you better, you, better, you better get yourself established. You better get yourself rooted. Because things ain't getting easier. You've heard me say that lots of times. Things aren't changing for the better in the United States of America. Things aren't changing for the better in the world. The news is going to start getting worse. You better be established. You better be anchored. You better, you better rebuild that altar that you first had when you first got saved. And you better go back there and you better hug that thing like you never hugged anything in your life. And hold on. Hold on to the cross. That's our hope. Now, something I, I, have, to, I have to confess. Something I've done and I've, 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 it's, it's not been good. See, I, I'll stand up here toward the end of the service. And I'll say... Well, we're going to dismiss, and if you need prayer, come on up and sit here, and I'll come pray for you. Then I'll forget to come back in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have to forgive me. So I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to say it right now. If you need prayer, you come up. If you want to go back to where you've begun, come up. If you need a healing in your body, come up, and we'll pray. Whatever you, if you need prayer this morning, come up and stand. And we'll pray with you. We'll take some time and pray. I don't want to close. If you want to go back to where you first built that altar, if you've been convicted by the Word this morning, and you said, Lord, I've, I've allowed so many things to clutter my life. I've allowed so much, uh, so much falseness and so much idolatry to clutter my life. I've built other altars that have become strongholds. If you want to pull those strongholds down this morning, won't you come and we'll pray with you? Won't you come and we'll pray with you? It's over. I'm going to ask you all to stand and just, just sing with us. George, could you come and maybe uh, do a little something and lead us in a song? And, and uh, If you need prayer for anything at all, won't you come? Won't you come? Won't you come? Thank you, Lord Jesus.